Kevin, and thank you, Bundit. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. It always helps when you ask these sorts of questions to start actually interrogating what, it is, what the heck it is you have been doing and to kind of review your whole, your, all of your explorations across your career. And in my case, it's been quite a long one. So I started um, designing, practicing and designing buildings in the early 90s, 1990, and still doing so now. And I'm, I'm just gonna have a little chat through, I suppose, the sort of the themes that have occupied me. So your question about boundaries was particularly interesting to me because I think it's a particularly relevant conversation to the particular place I occupy. So where we are is in the subtropics on the eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, and we're actually fortunate enough to inhabit one of the most benign uh, climates on the globe. What I mean by that is we actually can survive here as human beings and it's probably very similar in Hawaii and I wish I'd been there, but I'm seeing it through behind you, Kevin, through your window. It's, 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 it's a climate in which humans can actually survive without any artificial heating and cooling. You know, so that's something that's kind of inspired me from my very early education. And we had a great education at the University of Queensland way back in the mid seventies when I started. We had some really good teachers who totally understood and taught us very well about our climatic con conditions so that we knew it and it was sort of embedded almost in, in, in our consciousness and our DNA right from the beginning. And we had a, we've got a really interesting history of architects responding to those particular characteristics of place. From indigenous architecture, obviously, originally, through to the sort of um, architecture of the colonizers, which was very interesting, quite minimal, very much about using minimal materials uh, at, for maximum effect, really. And that's been a theme that's continued through our heritage. We had some very interesting architects who landed here in Brisbane, you know, the European diaspora after the, during and after the Second World War or even before, who were modernists, quite interesting uh, architects who um, really did, again, try to understand the qualities of this place, you know, the climatic qualities of this place. And what we have here is the opportunity to do remarkably... Um, I suppose, emotive and um, experiential architecture with minimal means. And that's because of the particular climate that we have here. So as I said, at university, we, 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 we were taught to understand how that worked, where the sun came from, where the breezes came from, and uh, to, to actually choreograph and tune those particular characteristics of these places. And very early on, the architecture that I was interested in was an architecture of ultimate flexibility. Minimal means, again, we can do that here. We don't need terribly much insulation. What, what we really can do here is create um, an architecture of complete transmutability and flexibility, which is a very interesting, you know, uh, it creates all sorts of interesting uh, possibilities. So right from the very beginning, and I can show you some images of projects later on, the first building and the first house that I did was an, an experiment in that. How can we make spaces that are almost not spaces? So right from the beginning, just to go back to your idea about boundaries, it was about the dissolution of boundaries. And again, we've got this kind of history, even with the traditional kind of colonial architecture of, of Queensland and the Queensland house of being able to inhabit the space between so boundaries don't exist so so we can inhabit a very special place that's somewhere between outside some yeah, is not outside is not inside but it is in a very special zone between those those conditions and so to be able to create an architecture that allows that kind of occupation has been what what I've been working on um, and to do that, what I've been experimenting with is ultimate sort of flexibility. So the idea of actually, dis as I keep saying, dissolving those boundaries, being able to adjust um, for the occupants to be able to, with very simple means and very low technology, as the traditional architecture did, um, afford a a occupation of the, the most... Um, comfortable and pleasant spaces. We can live in the garden here. We can live in the garden. So European architecture doesn't, doesn't apply. You know, so we, you know, so it's been an interesting kind of uh, development over, over many years of us working out how we actually occupy the garden. 
you know, and there've been different answers to that. And the way we can do it, we've got lush landscape, we've got lush, you know, beautiful lush landscape a la Hawaii. Um, we, we like to think of the architecture, those of us who've been thinking about it this way, is a completely minimal sort of enclosure, you know. Uh, so getting maximum experience and maximum ability to, to occupy that gorgeous space somewhere between inside and outside, but the ability to kind of um, um, adjust our environment very, very easily and with simple means. So one, one way that that happened in traditional houses was the veranda space, you know, so there's an enclosed interior, then there's a, often a very gorgeous and uh, generous and wide curtilage of verandas around a house, which is basically in the garden, but it's also part of the house. And so we can occupy this, this really beautiful, non-specific space. So it's almost like being within the boundary, but then having the ability to change that boundary. So boundaries are, are pretty interesting. So that was great that you asked that question. And that's certainly what, you know, what we've been um, doing with the, with, the, with the architectural experiments. And what you then find is if the physical adjustment can happen, it engenders remarkable social flexibility as well. Do you know, so even with small spaces, if there's ultimate flexibility in terms of the way they're occupied, if there's this absolutely, you know, um, uh, no barrier, I suppose, between the interior and the garden, and that those, those edges change and adjust, then, you know, you, you've got the ultimate sort of social flexibility. So you can have quite small spaces that can be occupied in different ways, and the occupants tune them. So you tune them for, for privacy and you tune them at, or openability and you tune them for climatic um, adjustability as well. So it's a rather gorgeous thing. So that's more easily achieved at the small <laughs> individual house scale. But again, throughout my kind of um, architectural practice, I suppose over the last 30 years or so, um, I've been experimenting with that across all of the scales. So the sp first experiments were, you know, small scale architecture, but it is in our environment and in our place, it's totally applicable to all the scales. And so the last project I'll, I, I would show you and talk about is um, a, a high rise, a subtropical high rise building, which is sort of my sort of, I suppose, final project in my practice. Um, I designed that with Richard Hassel from WOHA um, and it's now under construction in Brisbane. So that's been quite a thrill and it has been a fantastic opportunity to kind of apply all of that thinking to the huge urban scale. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's absolutely the same idea. How do we make something of that scale where each occupiable residence is completely tunable and adjustable by the occupants? doesn't need artificial heating or cooling, um, uh, uh, choreographs the natural qualities of the space, so it's all about natural breezes, etc. And the payoff again is fantastic amenity and experience, but also remarkably low energy use. And then again, if even if in this high rise, landscape and gardens permeate through, they're occupiable gardens, so that so the landscape is part of the is an architectural element, then um, yeah, then that's, that's, that's applying those very early ideas that I was experimenting with sort of 30 years ago to something of that scale. So that's been remarkably satisfying. Yeah. Definitely, we, we, def we have to do it. And we've got remarkable opportunity to do it in a place like ours and presumably also in Hawaii. So uh, certainly, um, the things that led to actually being able to do that project in Brisbane were exploring with the particular developers uh, ideas about how can we uh, reimagine um, high rise living and high rise residences in our subtropical city. So it was also a study that I was undertaking with a, with a colleague, you know, ideas about how do we create an architecture of ultimate permeability in an urban context. So, you know, so, so like the small houses and the idea of the permeation of breezes, permeation of, um, of landscape, the permeations of humans, the idea of allowing the natural systems to flow through the infrastructure that we make. 
that is what we've been looking at at the urban scale here. We, and, and quite a few architects have been thinking about it. We actually do have a, uh, the Brisbane City Council has a design guide now that is the result of many decades of architects thinking about this in our place. And it's called Buildings That Breathe. And uh, it's this notion that at an urban scale, um, we can and we should and we need to, from the point of view of sustainability and amenity and how to deal with climate change and, you know, and, and how, how the city has to um, survive, I suppose, and create amenity for inhabitants and increase in density without without limiting opportunities. So we did a lot of uh, studies of how that might translate to our place. And um, that was, the developers were particularly interested in those ideas. And so we had some schemes and, and modeling on various different sites in the city about how we can absolutely open up the ground plane radically to, so, that, so that these large buildings don't actually subtract from the public space, but actually add to it and become almost part, create almost a kind of a network of green spaces at the ground level. So minimising the footprint on the ground and, and you'll see how that, that kind of has resolved in this particular project I'm going to show you. Giving over public space rather than subtracting it from the city and the citizenry. The benefits of that are, as I said, this contiguous landscape shaded space that we can create in the city. So it's almost like the city is a parkland. The buildings shade the public spaces. The bases of those buildings, which are absolutely as minimal as possible, are part of a, a network of public space, all accessible, that unlock public space for the city and allow the permeation, as I said, of greenery. They create shade, they allow people um, landscape, breezes, even wildlife, <laughs> birds and things to actually, to actually kind of move through the city uninterrupted. So that is what, that, they're the foundation ideas of this, this um, large project that I'm going to sh show you some images of. So that was really interesting because the, the, the developers were really interested in that. And then um, the history of the project was, um, I was actually in China at a, um, um, tall buildings uh, conference in at the end of 2014 and um, I got the call from the client and she said and this is another nice story woman ex-architect uh, uh, design and development manager of this really interesting development company and so she'd sort of known about me and knew the history of my work and so she gave me a call uh, and I was on the train between Shanghai and um, Beijing and she said, Lib, we have just bought the most amazing site in Brisbane and this is absolutely ideal for the ideas that we've been talking about. I said, really? That sounds good. Um, where is it? And then she told me where it was. I said, oh, yeah, that really is. <laughs> I think I might have said a four-letter word, but I said, yeah, that actually is one of the best sites in Brisbane and gives us all sorts of remarkable opportunities to actually experiment with this idea that they've been keen on. And then the next thing she said to me was, and what I would like, because she knew that I knew Richard Hassel, we'd spoken together at conferences and things. And she said, what I would really like is if you and Richard could get together and come up with an amazing design and wow us, you know, this is the whole kind of development company and the other design managers. If you can wow us with a really amazing design on this site based on the ideas that we've been talking about, then you've got the job. Ooh, <laughs> pinch, pinch, that never happens. So, and that is actually what has happened. So we got together, you know, and came up with a, a design that actually probably wowed them a little bit too much. And, uh, but they, you know, to their credit, they have um, stuck with it and continued through and it is now under construction on that site. So that's, uh, <laughs> so that's been a really, and for me, I, I, I sort of feel, feel that that's been quite a nice kind of, I suppose a little bit of a culmination of the, the story of what I've been thinking about, as I said earlier, you know, right from the beginning stages of my practice and then to have this opportunity to do that, to actually, I suppose, enact some of those ideas that we've been talking about at the large scale and very much in parallel with um, that design guide and ideas that, as I said, the Brisbane City Council now has called Buildings That Breathe. 
And as I said, that is the culmination of decades of really interesting architectural thought and experimentation here, completely inspired by this place. So, yeah, so that is a project that I'll show you. Yes. Ventilator, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that doesn't need to be the case in these benign environments, these breezy benign environments with really good climatic conditions. So for some reason, we've imported models from elsewhere to the places that you and I are in that are completely inappropriate to the places. And so we're just trying to have, try, needing to kind of unravel, go back, rethink from first principles what it is we need to do in this place. Yeah. The plans will explain it a little bit better. We've lifted this whole kind of zone, which is actually the car parking zone, well above the, the ground level. It's all open and ventilated um, you know, with, with gardens surrounding it. And then there's an open plaza on top of it, which is sort of the open garden recreation level of the building. And then apartments above, which will make more sense if I, um, if I start showing you some plans, etc. The plans will make it, help make a little bit more sense of this. But I was talking before about the idea of openness at the ground plane. Here we have the main street of Brisbane that actually kind of um, heads towards the river and the Story Bridge. What we've done here is we've, we've raised the whole sort of base, if you like, of the building above the street and, uh, and created an open plaza. And I can send you some more useful plans later on. But, but this, this big move of just elevating the car parking above the street and creating a 20 metre high open plaza, which is public gardens that that um, can take people right down to the river edge and the parkland means that we've um, created a, a totally naturally ventilated, suspended um, parking zone here, surrounded by generous gardens all the way around. Um, and, uh, and then above that sits a garden deck, basically just, you know, subtropical planting, et cetera, swing pools, et cetera. And then on top of that, the apartments proper, and I'll show you a plan of how the apartments actually operate. But basically the planning arrangement has allowed each one of those houses in the sky, if you like, to have um, natural light and ventilation around three and four sides of them, just because it's a quite an interesting sort of exploded and clustered plan. And then landscape uh, and gardens all the way through open lobby spaces. So when you get out of the lift, you arrive at a garden space and then each house, you walk through a garden to each house, which sort of almost sits in a garden, which is like a house in that it has three or four walls, uh, all um, external walls, which allow natural light and ventilation. And they're all totally naturally ventilated. And again, the plan will help explain that a bit better when I get to it. That's another view from the riverside. That's, um, that's that tall view that you saw before. So you can sort of start seeing the forms of the clustered towers, this radical elevation above the ground and its location right on, right on the river. So yeah, the, the building actually creates public plaza space that allows people to go from the main street of the city uh, right down to the, to the riverside, which is a pretty radical move. There's a typical apartment plan there. I'll try and make that a bit larger. So you can see there that these houses, these clustered towers with totally sort of open garden lobby spaces and all of this generous external wall uh, allows for complete natural cross ventilation through the apartments. So that there's no room in these apartments that have that typical arrangement where they're, you know, like bathrooms and kitchens against a core. So these can operate with absolutely no, no air conditioning. And so it's a very, very open sort of exploded plan. Uh, it creates that rather interesting form as well. And then all the way through the whole building, which is 288 metres tall, are woven these gardens. And the idea here is they're not just wallpaper, green walls, they're occupiable gardens with real trees in them. And so that's, that's how it works. So you can arrive at this um, lobby with views back this way to the city and out to the river this way and each of the houses um, and there are different different arrangements on each floor but exactly the same floor plate shape allow 
cross ventilation and natural light to every room, including these, these bathrooms. And that's aided by these full height um, voids and gardens and, um, and air all the way through. So it's, a, so it's actually applying that idea of you know, natural ventilation and natural light right through this building, creating that kind of amenity, but also radical reduction in energy use. That elevated car park does that as well. So it's pretty nuts in our floodable city to, to do underground car parking. <laughs> yeah, oh, right on the river edge, you know, it's likely to flood every now and again. And we had a, our last major devastating flood in 2011. They happen. So that's part of the motivation of elevating the, the car parking zone that you saw right above the street. We've got a pretty, pretty cool kind of double helix uh, car parking ramp leading up to that, taking up minimal uh, footprint as well. But what that means again is that the car parks themselves don't need mechanical um, lighting and don't need um, artificial lighting and ventilation. And this whole arrangement uh, is likely to, to cut about 60% out of the energy use compared to a typical apartment building. So it's just those it's just those big moves that come out of actually understanding how things operate here, where the breezes come from, you know, how we actually choreograph all of those natural systems that exist in the city and then giving over um, public space rather than subtracting it from the city. So that's quite a, that sort of explains a fair bit. That's the only plan I've got to show you, but I can show you others uh, if you like. But I can run through more images of this building if you're interested. So here, so I'm sitting up here at the moment. <laughs> this is uh, this is uh, this is our house in St Lucia in Queensland, not far from the university. Um, uh, we designed this house, and it was constructed in 19, it was finished in 1998, um, based on all of those the principles that I've been talking about. It's a one room thick, very simple pavilion. Uh, with this sort of double height space, which is a sort of piano noble, I suppose, the living space that you saw an image of before. And this, this kind of elevation sort of explains how all of the spaces interrelate. We're looking from the northern side, so it faces due north. It means, again, um, we can be very careful about and considered about how we kind of tune, tune the climate. You can see a large overhang here that's exactly at the right dimension to admit winter sun into this big tall wall, uh, glazed and openable wall and ex exclude it in summer. So it's just that very precise knowing exactly how the sun angles work. So that's all we need to do in a way to sort of control the climate. And as I said before, this is a, this is a large openable wall. There are fixed glass patterns, top and bottom, and then two, pan two glass panels in the middle that counterweight each other so you can pull the bottom one down and the top one up and that opens a huge band of ventilation right through the centre of the house and that's summer mode. Uh, at, it works with the half levels because of the slope across the site. So this is the entry bridge you can see coming in beside the pool, the body of water which also helps to cool the whole site. Huge shade uh, from the original poinciana tree. So the whole garden is basically a shady grove. And again, uh, you can really, really experience that if you walk into the garden from the street and it's five degrees cooler on the site just due to you know the the, the very generous shade of the huge tree and then um, and then we just as I said we sort of choreograph the, the the sun angles and the breezes and that's it it's just a very simple rectilinear plan uh, Bottom level is the, the rooms for our two sons when they were around that lead straight out onto the garden. Half a level up is the sort of the knockabout kind of rumpusy playroom, which is now a great space for the grandkids. Half a level up to the main living space here. Big, generous deck uh, sliding out underneath the Poinciana limbs. And then half a level up again to our bedroom space and half a level up again to the bridge. And I, as I said, I'm sitting here at the end of this bridge, <laughs> this library bridge here <laughs> right now. It's so that, that sort of tells the story, tells the story of our house. But again, you know, um, the same ideas that we've been thinking about right from the beginning about how do we actually make minimal enclosure that's ultimately tunable, completely responsive to the particularities of this place, eschewing, um, 
eschewing superficial detail, where the operations of the building and the materials of the thing are what give it its decorative qualities as well. So it's all about, you know, the kind of inhabitation of space and enjoying all of the qualities of the space with minimal intervention in a way of the architecture. So that's some um, wonderful. Just, I'm going to be going through there. Oh no, this is the, one of the very early uh, projects that I did in uh, at the beginning of my pra practice at that uh, little beach house right on the beach um, on the Sunshine Coast, right behind the dunes. First experiments in, it's completely openable as well. And if I've got a plan here, I'll explain how that works. But these are just some images again of how can we use completely prosaic materials to give us the qualities of the, of the architecture. So here, this is very simple, just ply lining, but the, the, the very dimensions of the sheet and how you sort of use cover battens are what give the kind of language of the building. This is um, super six fibre cement roofing and just enjoying the qualities of that, just creating the sun hoods on the northern side of this building. And there's a totally openable double layered wall on the north, which is uh, timber shutters on the outside and huge you know, glass sliding panels on the inside. So that again, in uh, winter, the glass can be closed down and the timber shutters can be slid away, allowing the winter sun to come into that space that faces direct north again. But in summer, say on a summer evening, the, the timber shutters, you know, which allow breeze through can be closed, uh, glass slid away, and we can let the breeze uh, right through. And so they're just very simple kind of um, um, low tech <laughs> details that also give the architectural quality to the house. And that was one of their images again of that idea of um, the plywood dimensions itself creating the language and the character of the architecture. It's very small. I've got an obsession about smallness as well. So this house is, you know, 100 square metres, but again, spatially choreographed uh, in an interesting way. That's, yeah. that's the beginning. Uh, our, our house is somewhere in the middle. I've got lots of other images that I could share with you later on, but so this is, a, you know, the kind of tiny scale right through to the scale of um, 4 for 3 Queen Street, but the same principles throughout, which are all about direct response to this place. Um, yeah, certainly um, when I started studying architecture, there were no role models for me of women practicing architecture. What I always wanted to do was practice because I had this incredible urge to create buildings, uh, create architecture. Um, it was, I had, so I had to kind of invent my own way of practicing. I, I, I knew pretty early that I probably wasn't going to fit comfortably into a standard uh, commercial practice, which at that scale, that stage, were all run by men, I suppose. And I, I started, I had developed a pretty comprehensive idea of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to experiment with in architecture. So I started my own practice very early. Um, you know, I did work for up some small firms who were fantastic, really great, you know, really great. Lindsay and Kerry Clare, you might have heard of them. Um, a couple of other really good architects who are very small firms and I started working out crumbs I can do this myself because in a small practice you pretty much have to do everything so it was a fantastic steep learning curve and also this very direct relationship with clients started working out that I could do that well I could I could have a you know a good kind of working relationship with clients and that they could we could work out how to do these things together and all of the the projects are all about you know, not about me superimposing, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, idea of architectural style on projects, but developing with these conversations with the clients and understanding what they needed um, and developing a very good and understanding relationship with, with, with them, which I very much enjoyed. That's how the architecture happened and that's how I learned. And so I knew from a pretty early stage working in small practices that that was something that I felt very comfortable doing develop good relationships with clients, <coughs> excuse me, then um, started being asked by clients to do the work for them, just have a sip of my tea. Mm. So that's how, the early, that's how the early projects happened and it sort of went from there, so it sort of burgeoned from there. And so much, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's so much about those relationships 
and once people, you know, enjoyed working with one and then there was a good result out of it that they were very happy with, that just developed into quite a, a busy practice. So I often say to the students, look, I think one of your big design challenges is designing the way that you work and design the design of your practice. And that has to be, that has to reflect what it is you're doing and what it is you're contributing. And the other thing I say to them is, <coughs> this sounds a bit like brain mar, I suppose, but it's very, um, it's a very, it's a, it's a very responsible uh, profession. We're designing the infrastructure of the lives that we all share well into the future. And these things will be, these things that we make will be here well after we're here. You better do it really well and very responsibly. It's a huge, it's a huge honour, but it's also a huge responsibility. So I guess from an early, early um, stage in uh, when I was practising architecture, starting to practise architecture, I just thought, what is the contribution that you can make, and how can you, how can you, um, how can you make uh, a positive uh, contribution? So that's been one of the things that's kind of shaped the way I approach things. It was never very careerist. You know, so it was just about, um, you know, what, what's the best thing we can do? And I've always loved that uh, Queensland history of making things from absolutely minimal means, which we've got a great tradition of. Love that from the point of view of um, being responsible with resources, but also, you know, working out how we can make high impact, highly evocative, great ex architectural experiences with almost nothing. And then that, you know, then that comes into the kind of adjustability conversation that we were saying before. So the boundaries, I guess I kind of tried to dissolve the boundaries to my practice by just saying, this is, <laughs> this is how I'm going to design my way of working. And I'm not going to particularly uh, worry about how it's been done before. So I just sort of, I just sort of proceeded that way and thought about, thought about what it is that I was doing for the, for the clients, because I still think it's an amazing honour that people ask you to design the spaces that they're going to live in or the spaces that they're going to build for other purposes. You know, it's a huge responsibility. And, I, and I, even at my late stage, I still get this enormous thrill of actually walking into a space that started as this germ of an idea that then developed, you know, with the clients and, you know, the huge exercise and it's a very slow art of actually creating these things and building them and all of the negotiation and all of the convincing that you have to do through the whole process and the, the enormous exercise that it is just to create even a small building, you know, I still get this enormous thrill yeah. going into those spaces. And then the other huge thrill is witnessing the people inhabiting them. And I'm old enough now to have actually witnessed people live, you know, you know, experiencing their whole family life in a space that, like the beach house that was on the screen before, was on the screen, experiencing their whole um, family life over 20 years or so or 30 in that space and it's working in the way that you might have imagined with them. So that's the kind of boundary crossing. And then over time, people just recognise, oh, well, she seems to be able to do it. I think we trusted her to do it. And then ultimately in my career, that, that meant that after 21 years of my own practice, I was invited to become design director of a larger, you know, more commercial practice. And that's how the, that's the practice from which the 443 Queen Street. So I was design director of Architectus. Um, and that's how I was able to then work on those slightly larger scale buildings. But I had also... Um, been working on in my own practice, wanting to kind of increase the scale and 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 diversify with the building types that I so I've been doing schools and university colleges and things like that as well, just and multiple residential stuff, just to again uh, keep applying those basic principles that I felt were incredibly important in our place to uh, different scales and different typologies. Yeah, so it's design, designing one's own way of practising was the way I kind of dissolved those particular boundaries over time. And I'm talking about three decades.